OK, then good morning, everybody. So um, I'm Karen Twist. I'm a senior educational psychologist and I'm also the strategic lead for autism and neurodevelopmental conditions. And um, what we're going to do today is Rachel's asked me to do a very brief presentation on ADHD and particularly also thinking about what is the current pathway. So I'm going to give you an incredibly quick whistle stop tour and trying to just really focus on the key issues around ADHD and this telling you where the pathway is at the moment. I need to give you a very clear caveat that the current pathway is not the finalized pathway because we're still working on tweaking it and thinking about it, but actually we've made some significant changes already, which hopefully will be beneficial to, to, to most people. The one thing we do need to do and we will be soon doing is looking at post assessment pathway and if any of you are interested in that in particular as at the moment there is very very little post assessment um, support or post diagnostic support for children and young people who have a diagnosis of ADHD then please look out for all the engagement events around that that will be published um, in the near future and come and join those sessions um, because I think it's really really important to hear your views on that. Okay next slide please. So what is ADHD? Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder we know that it's a medical diagnosis and we use a diagnostic manual, mainly the DSM-5. It's an American diagnostic manual to see whether a child or young person will meet that diagnosis. I think what's very, very important to state at this point is that it's a neurological condition that unfortunately there is no, there is no particular blood test or anything that you can do medically to be able to um, make a decision around whether a child or young person has this condition. It's based purely on observational um, criteria and on what we observe of a child and young person in different contexts. Um, there is also talk about, you know, that ADHD can present in many, many different ways. Some children and young people may only have um, a lot, may, may present with lots and lots of inattention and, and have a real difficulty to, to have um, sustained um, focus um, and concentration. But Pediatricians tell me when they observe these children, they often see the other parts of ADHD in there as well. So the other two areas that we look at in terms of behaviours is the hyperactivity and the impulsivity. And yeah, it's a neurodiverse, it's, it falls under the umbrella of neurodiversity, um, which there's a question right at the end that I will be telling you about is, I don't know how many people are aware, aware but if you look at the SEND census and the categories of SEND that the DFE collect, um, autism is the only condition that has its own categorization. ADHD doesn't and unfortunately it ends up in the SEMH um, category, social emotional mental health category, which obviously it's not. It's a neurobiological condition and I think we need to be very clear about that. All right, next slide, please. Um, so what are the key characteristics of ADHD? I've already mentioned them, inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. But being a psychologist, I always like to reframe those um, uh, sort of those kind of characteristics into the positive. So we know that um, people with uh, um, ADHD are very good multitaskers. It doesn't mean that they can't pay attention. Often they do, and often they flit between different activities. And actually, they are able to multitask. We know that um, a, a, a children with ADHD are enormously energetic, and we need to tap into that energy. And actually, they're not, you know, impulsivity can also be seen as some, as being, um, having a lot of spontaneity. So we need to think about how we can kind of redirect those behaviours and those categories into something more positive for the child and young person. Next slide. So prevalence is very, very interesting. I don't know how many people are aware, but actually the prevalence of ADHD at the moment in the UK, in the British population, is double that of autism. So NHS benchmarking tells us it's three to five percent. Um, so we know that it's one of the most common childhood um, conditions. Um, yeah, so in the UK, surveys also suggest that, that there's a much higher prevalence in boys than in girls. And I'll be saying a little bit more about that in a moment. Next slide. 
So as I said, three to one prevalence um, for boys. And you know, the thing is when you get to adulthood, the diagnoses are almost equal. So we are beginning to think, are we missing girls in school? So the latest sort of um, thinking and the research has, has told us that actually just like within autism, um, girls present, can present differently to boys. We are finding exactly the same um, in AD, with ADHD. And the reason being that we find that the girls often um, it's the inattention that is much greater than the hyperactivity and the impulsivity, whereas in boys, we find it's the, ha the hyperactivity and the impulsivity that is greater. And of course, a, a girl sitting quietly at the back of the classroom who may be showing signs of hy hyperactivity, but they're much tinier. She may just be tapping her hand on her leg or something like that is often missed. And therefore, we are we are starting to look much more at, OK, OK, are we missing girls and ADHD in our schools? Next slide, please. So I've already said ADHD is a very misunderstood um, condition. It's not a behavioral condition. It's not a mental, mental health need. It is a neurobiological condition. And consequently, we need to focus on that. And, you know, it is about understanding it and it is about how we describe it and how we categorize it. Um, and how and how we can actually think about it in a more positive context. Next slide. So I've already mentioned some of the other positive things, um, and there is just a whole list of things we know people with ADHD have. Um, these are the, the kind of the positive characteristics. I think we're all very familiar with well, I am. I'm quite a fan of the voice. So I like watching that. And if you watch him carefully, you'll see how he manages his condition. He kind of he will, you know, he will um, get up quite often out of his seat He'll move around a bit, um, etc. So he's learned how to manage his condition in his adult life. You know, the thing is with with um, adults um, that you can actually think about how you are going to manage your condition when you in, in terms of the career you choose. There used to be this thinking that you grow out of being having ADHD. That's not true. If you have ADHD and it really is the condition you have, you will have it for life. But when you get older and when you choose a particular um, uh, sort of a, a interest and, and focus on your career, you can go into that in it, you, choosing a career that is more conducive to you actually using the positive aspects of the condition. So it's just to think about, I mean, lots of people with ADHD that I know really go into the outdoor world. They kind of, they, they're very active people and they participate and their careers are actually very much outdoors. So just something to think about. In schools, we expect these children to sit still at desks, which is hugely, hugely difficult for them. Next slide. OK, however, it can also be quite debilitating and we need to recognize that. And when we've spoken to people with ADHD and particularly children and young people, this is how they describe themselves. It's like being in a fog. It's like a radio receiver that's not tuned in completely to a single station. It's like being in the middle of an orchestra without a conductor. Sometimes you just feel kind of directionless, aimless, don't really know, know what, what you're supposed to be doing. In a classroom, what often happens is the teacher might say, the word fridge and the next thing your mind might go off onto something else and you think about that bottle of juice in the fridge that you really would like to drink because you feel thirsty and your mind has wandered off somewhere else um, and it's that aspect of ADHD which is which is often something that our that our teaching staff don't recognize and see in the classroom what they do often see is is as I've said before the hyperactive side or the impulsive side and it comes out in the behaviors next slide OK, so social impacts. The other thing we do need to recognize if we leave ADHD untreated, I'm going to put that in inverted commas, or we don't support children and young people appropriately with ADHD, then these are the things that can happen to them. Um, and then unfortunately, these then develop into more um, behavioral needs or um, and, and ultimately mental health as well. So so they end up in the SEMH category within the same senses only because we haven't actually supported them as well as we could have. OK, moving on. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because currently this is the situation in Somerset for our children with potential ADHD, how we assess and how we diagnose. 
So I think it's very important to be very clear, and this is also in NICE guidelines, we wouldn't, we wouldn't actually consider a child for an assessment for ADHD that is aged five and younger. The reason being that little people exhibit those characteristics of um, inattention, hyperactivity and impulsivity. You often see little children flitting from, from one activity to the next. They often don't sustain concentration for a long period of time because we're still teaching them to do that. Um, you often hear them interrupting their mums. Um, you know, you might have that experience yourself if you think back of your own, your own children when they were very little. How often do you have to remind them to say, sorry, I'm talking to so and so. I'll give you a chance in a minute. We're still, we're still teaching them. We're still um, giving them the opportunity to learn the skills, the kind of the social skills necessary. And that is why we wouldn't ever really go down the route of assessing a child um, very young. There is the rare, rare um, um, occasion that we might ask, um, that we might assess a child at the age of five if the, if the evidence is incredibly compelling. Um, so nice guidelines um, do talk about, um, sorry Rachel, I'm trying to admit Nicola, but it's not actually working. So if you or Claire can try that. Um, sorry, just waiting to admit, admit this person who's waiting in the lobby. So, okay, whilst, whilst, whilst waiting to admit, um, some more guests. I want to just talk about um, the, you know, the, in terms of what NICE tell us about um, recommending any kind of parent support pre and post assessment and actually during during um, um, an assessment phase. I think it's it's really important to understand that when we want a child's behaviour to change, then actually all the significant adults in that child's life may need to do something different first. So when we talk about significant adults, we, that would be our parents. It would be, um, you know, extended family who have who have a play a very big role. It could be grandparents. It could be also include all our teaching staff who have a relationship with that child. It could be significant adults through extracurricular activities, etc. It's about understanding what it is that actually makes the child behave the way they do. So we all play a collective responsibility and understanding, is there something we could do different that would change that child's behavior? And because ADHD is a diagnosis that is that is purely based on behavioral observation, it's that's the reason why we ask that question. And I often consider myself extremely lucky because I became a parent after I trained to be an educational psychologist. So I actually had a lot of training around understanding child development and actually understanding what it what it could be like as a parent. And believe you me, I still make huge mistakes in my own parenting and often seek support and advice and often pick up a book and read about it. Most of us do not have that opportunity. Most of us have become parents without receiving any training prior to that because it's not a requirement. And most of us parent through instinct or parent through the way we have learned to be parented, uh, learned through the parenting of our own of our own parents. So, and that is why I think NICE, NICE does say and recommend that we should always seek parenting intervention and support, and it should be done at every step of the way of any kind of neurodevelopmental condition. So pre the assessment, during the assessment, and actually especially post assessment. I believe there's a real requirement around this. And unfortunately at the moment, the only post assessment support that really is available is medication. And my, my and I'll say this in a moment as well, my view is that medication, medication should always come along with social and emotional support as well, um, because that is the time when we can try and teach strategies and interventions to support the child and the young person. So in terms of the uh, neurodevelopmental pathway at the moment, you'll see um, a, a, um, a link um, on the slide, and that is to our new um, pathway, which is on the local Apple website. And 
basically we're asking schools to do what they always do and what they do quite well is use a graduated approach to understand that child's needs and how we're going to meet those needs and review those needs before we actually go down a diagnostic assessment pathway route. We don't believe that it is um, the right thing to put children through quite invasive um, you know, diagnostic assessments if we haven't got the evidence to show that that is what's needed. We wouldn't want to do a neurodevelopmental assessment purely to kind of rule out a condition because it is, it's, it's, as I've said, it's an invasive assessment for a child or young person to go through and therefore we want to make sure it's the right thing for that child or young person to go through that process. And if it, if it is the right thing, then we do absolutely and we must go through that process. So we do ask for our schools and our um, SENCOs to follow the usual graduated approach and then together with you as parents complete the next steps form which is on the um, local offer website. And in some cases, especially when a child or young person is already aged 11 plus, we would ask them to become involved in that process too. The reason being that uh, Gilly comp competencies tell us that um, a child over the age of 11 can make decisions for themselves. And obviously if a young person is already 16, then they actually have to be the main person giving consent for this process. OK, so um, the assessment would include home information, developmental history, uh, clinic observations, different rating scales, the Connors rating scale, the SNAP4, we use that, um, and school information. To be able to get a diagnosis of ADHD, you have to show similar characteristics, those three characteristics I, I spoke about early, happening across two different settings of that child's life for a period of at least six months. So it has to, that it has to show, we have to see that across different, um, different settings in that child's life. So at home and at school, or potentially at an extramural activity that they go to, et cetera. At the moment, um, when, when a school have completed the uh, next steps process, it goes either to the MDT triage for the neurodevelopmental um, children and young people partnership, or it may go through to the East Mendip service. The East Mendip service is a tiny little service that services only the Froome community and a little bit of Shepton Mallet. Um, and, and the other service, the, the Children Young People Neurodevelopmental Partnership, serves the rest of um, Somerset. If the child is under the age, if the child is 11 or younger, then the triage will make the decision whether to um, proceed with an ADHD assessment and then hand it over to the paediatric departments at either Yeovil or Musgrove, depending on where the child lives, their home address and the GP practice address. So two, we usually say two, wherever the um, two of those are, that is where the child will receive um, the assessment. If the child is over the age of 11, the form just gets passed on to CAMS. CAMS do the triage and then a decision is made whether to go ahead with an assessment or not. For the East Mendip service, doesn't matter what the child's age is, this, the, the, the assessment will be carried out, the triage and assessment will be carried out with through that um, process, the East Mendip service, which sits in Baines under Virgin Care. OK, next slide, please. OK, so I can't see the side at the moment. I'm going to try and admit Claire because obviously she's kind of left, but thank you. OK, so um, so if we look at this sort of diagram, this is what's on the local offer website. And what we're saying to our schools is please make sure you identify the needs through the graduated approach as outlined in the code of practice. Provide the interventions and supports that you would normally do. And through that process, we can see if there's compelling evidence for the child to be put forward for an ADHD assessment. Next slide. So this is really just about the graduated approach and thinking about what actually happens in a school and, and, and links in with the code of practice. So first of all, there is universe, universal high quality teaching that we would expect all our children and young people to receive, no matter who they are. Um, part of that is also supporting children with special needs um, already, because we know that um, 
all our schools receive um, funding to be able to support children with special needs. And that we call um, the element two funding. And with that would be that would take place at what we call send support level. So um, children with EHCPs obviously get additional funding through the local authority, and that funding would then also be needed to be used to support these children. And then this is there's a document on the local offer website that we have co-produced with our SENCOs to explain what support is out there, what could we do, and there is actually a section around um, concentration and inattention difficulties um, that uh, SENCOs can tap into and think about how they support our children and young people um, with uh, ADHD or even if they are at the, at the stage of actually recognising that there's a high level of um, need around concentration and inattention, hyperactivity and um, impulsivity. OK, next slide. So what happens? So, so the SENCO realises, yes, we do need to actually, um, there's a need for an assessment. So then they can complete the next steps form um, by providing all that information in the next steps form together with you as parents. If however the child is electively home educated, then we ask that um, the, the parent contact the uh, parent care forum and together you will complete the, the next steps form and then we ask the GP just to kind of sign it off and submit it to the, um, to the pathway, whether it's the, um, uh, to the Neurodevelopmental Partnership or whether it is to the East Mendip service. If there's a dispute between a parent and a, or kind of a difference of, a, of opinion, let's rather call it that, um, then the parent could seek support from Sendias or what we are saying to our schools now to preserve your relationship with the schools is ask the parents to complete their section, have a look at it. If you think there's really compelling evidence, but you're not seeing it in the school, then submit it to the triage anyway, just stating that that there's differences of um, observation of behaviours. And then we'll get the triage to make the decision around whether we can go ahead with an assessment or not. Um, and then if if it's gone to triage and then the decision obviously gets taken whether whether or not you be, should be informed along the way in terms of what, what the outcome is. Next slide, please. OK, so um, the assessment is not agreed. If the assessment is not agreed, then we should be signposting um, what else could what else what what support is is needed and if all what else is needed to be able to uh, agree an assessment um, and then if an assessment is agreed it would go down the assessment to the assessment service who would then provide um, the assessment as I've said at the moment if you're going through the um, children young people's neurodevelopmental partnership it will either go to uh, um, a Yeovil Hospital or to Musgrove Hospital, depending on the child's age, they have to be 11 or younger, um, in other words, primary school age. If it's over above that age, it will just get supported, it will just go be passed on to CAMS, who will pick that up. That's in the, the bigger area, in East Mendip, everything goes through their triage and the assessment is carried out by the East Mendip service. Next slide, please. So just very quickly, so what do we look for when we are thinking about ADHD? We know that there are um, areas of the, the, the kind of the, 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 the prefrontal cortex that are that are impacted by this condition. We know that some of these children don't kind of lack the neurotransmitter, particularly dopamine. And that is when we are looking at medicating is what we're trying to restore through medication. Um, that's just a very, very brief, brief explanation. There's a lot more to it, and, 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 but we haven't got time to go in depth around this at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, we also know that children with neurodevelopmental conditions, and particularly those with ADHD, have a lack in executive functioning. So exec executive functioning is just a name for all the mental skills that are used to organise and act on information. Um, it, it's kind of, you know, it's the, the function that helps us find our shoes, remember to do our homework, plan a trip to the cinema with friends. It helps us get get um, get to places on time. It helps us to decide what to prioritize. It helps us re regulate our emotional responses. 
So executive abilities are highly relevant for everyday life activities and for our social and how to be socially appropriate and and how to kind of function in our um, academic world as well. Next slide, please. So these are the types of things we're looking at if we talk about executive functionings. There are 11 skills and it's kind of um, it's kind of interrelated between emotion, cognition and function. That's really what it is. And 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 children, young people with ADHD really have a struggle in the development of these skills. And that is why we are trying to work with our schools at the moment to get them to understand executive functioning a lot better so they know what they need to put in place to be able to, to support children and young people with ADHD. Um, interestingly, sometimes it's just a tweak or something really small. The other day I was in a school um, observing a young person and it was really about the lack of being able to take initiative when having to sit down and get on with a task when they needed to work independently. So it was really easy to kind of um, remediate that in terms of giving some strategies and ideas of how we could help that, that child actually get down to the task they need to do when they need to do it. OK, next slide, please. We also know that uh, children, young people with uh, ADHD have real sensory differences, um, particularly around tactile the tactile sensory processing, uh, you know, they will touch everything and they sometimes just lash out impulsively and, and people think that they kind of hitting others, but not that's not necessarily what the intention is. So it's actually understanding their sensory world a lot better. Um, we know that they have huge issues with um, with intra, uh, interception, which is a kind of a new um, sensory skill that the, the interception is around what goes on inside your body. It's kind of that feeling of the butterflies in the stomach um, when you feel anxious, for example, and often they don't know how to how to kind of um, process that those feelings and what to do about that. And that can also sometimes lead them then to be impulsive. So another thing just to explore that we have to explore as part of an ADHD diagnostic process and what what we need to put in place to support um, children in understanding their sensory processing and the strategies they can put in place to help remediate the, the needs around this and the difficulties they might experience. Next slide. So yes, medication. I think it's really important to know and understand that medication doesn't cure ADHD. It simply creates a breathing space. I think, you know, um, Jim Rose and his uh, sort of comment that you, I'll, leave, I'll leave you to read is very, very apt. Um, and all that all that medication really does is allow a breathing space for us to teach the child or young person the skills in terms of how to deal with their um, characteristics around, um, you know, that the ADHD um, basically uh, kind of gives them. So, so, and it also is, is gives us all a breathing space, actually parents and teaching staff as well, to think about what is it that we need to put in place? What is it that we might need to do differently to actually support children who have this condition? So yes, so the three characteristics are on the top of the iceberg. We, I think most of us are familiar with the iceberg principle. The behaviours that we see are the ones on top, that the kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, but the majority of things that this child or young person may be experiencing is below the water. So we don't always see it, and therefore we have to kind of think about it and actually unpick how is ADHD impacting on the child and young person, and what is it that we need to put in place to support them. So what are we telling our, our schools? So at the moment, I managed to get um, a small pot of funding from NHS England, and that has allowed us to do some, some support and uh, training for all our schools. And we've invited schools to invite parents of um, children with ADHD to this training as well. But the key things that we are saying to our schools is support and teach emotional awareness and regulation, support and teach executive function, support and teach sensory awareness and regulation, support and teach skills to facilitate friendship and be mindful of social, um, social thinking. 
um, and remember our perspective. I think this is such an important statement. They're not giving these children, not giving us a hard time. They are having a hard time. Um, what can we do to support whilst they are developing the skills they need to manage more independently? And the big thing about ADHD is that we need to ensure there's a consistent support process between home and school. They need to receive the same support to be able to manage better going forward. OK, it is time for questions, but I have two big questions and and some of my colleagues from the Parent Care Forum know that I often ask these questions. As I've mentioned, the DFE don't give ADHD its own cat categorization. Should they be is the question or should we have one um, categorization around neurodiversity? So this is something you might be able to take up with, um, you know, through the forum with with um, with a DFE. It's not something I'm for, I've, I've raised it many, many times, but something to think about. Does ADHD need better recognition within the whole um, code of practice? Um, and then the next thing that I've put here is the autistic population prefer to be regarded as having ASC rather than ASD. Now, this is this this, this is an interesting question, but this is kind of what we've been told that they they would rather they be, they be um, referred to as having a condition than having a disorder. We haven't done the same for the ADHD population. ADHD population doesn't seem to have given us that same same um, information. So my question is, should we should we be calling it ADHD or should we be calling it ADHC as our colleagues have moved from ASD to ASC. So these are two questions that I have, but I don't have the answers to them. Um, and I'm going to hand over to questions now. 